Hello and welcome to the webinar. Today's topic is Organic Management of Cucurbit Downy Mildew in the Northeast by Chris Smart of Cornell University. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic Community of Practice at extension.org. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website at extension.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. We'll be reading as many questions as we can after the presentation is over. So I would like to welcome back Chris Smart of Cornell University. Several years ago, Chris participated in a webinar on late blight management, and today she's going to be speaking with us about her work on downy mildew. Chris has been working at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station in Geneva, New York since 2003, and she works with growers to combine resistant varieties and cultural practices to control a variety of different vegetable pathogens. Okay, well thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk with everyone about cucurbit downy mildew today. Um, I'm going to start with uh, about the pathogen itself. Uh, cucurbit downy mildew is caused by a water mold, um, also known as an oomycete, and the Latin name, the official name of the pathogen is Pseudoperonospora cubensis. Now you don't need to know that, but as a plant pathologist, I feel like it's my duty to make sure that I say Peronospora cubentis at least uh, once or twice during this webinar. Cucurbit downy mildew uh, will attack all cucurbits. Cucumbers are by far the most susceptible, but it will attack melons, winter squash, summer squash, pumpkin, uh, cucumbers. Uh, any cucurbit is uh, susceptible. And in this uh, slide here, on the uh, left -hand photo, you will see um, a grower's field that has uh, cucurbit downy mildew. And a lot of the leaves you can see are brown and they've actually died uh, from, from the pathogen. Now, the symptoms you can see in the middle and on the right, um, they, they have a yellowing on the upper leaf surface and they start out as a yellow spot that is usually, but not always, uh, delineated by the veins in the leaf. And uh, then as the uh, lesion gets older or as the, the pathogen is, is on the plant longer, those lesions turn kind of tan and papery. Okay, um, so the first symptoms that uh, you'll see in a, in a cucur cucurbit field, and these are both cucumber here, um, are yellow lesions on the upper leaf surface. And um, when I'm scouting for the, the disease in the field, um, I'll actually look across the field and look for uh, leaves that have just look like they have a bit of yellow or a yellow spot. And it's actually, once, once you practice at it a bit, um, you can pick it out quite quickly. It will be um, the, some of the younger leaves. A lot of times, when plants get diseased, it might be the older leaves or the leaves that are near the bottom of the plant. That's because the pathogen might come from the soil. But cucurbit downy mildew is very different. You'll see those uh, symptoms of cucurbit downy mildew on the middle or upper leaves and the younger leaves. This particular pathogen likes healthy leaves. It doesn't like the older leaves. And so you'll see it on, on the really healthy leaves, some of the younger leaves of the plant. And then really characteristic are uh, the gray spores of the pathogen that are always on the lower leaf surface of, um, of that cucumber or other cucurbit. As I said earlier, um, as the spots on the leaf, as those lesions get older, um, they will turn tan and papery. So uh, this is actually a fairly characteristic um, lesion of a young lesion that you might see in the field. Um, just barely yellow and of course, you know, there are quite a few things that can cause a yellow spot on a leaf, um, but cucurbit downy mildew is certainly one of them. Then as the lesion gets older, um, you can see these lesions here are um, in some ways delineated by the veins of the plant, and then you can see these tan, papery, older lesions, um, and this is all on the upper leaf surface. On the lower leaf surface, um, you'll see 
these gray spores, and I'll show you a close-up of those in a minute, but I wanted to just give you an indication of what it looks like to the naked eye when you flip that leaf surface over. And these are the spores of the pathogen that are really going to fly in the wind and um, uh, move to the other plants in your field and um, plants in neighboring fields. So, so these spores are really the ones that cause us the trouble. So what we have in this slide here are some older leaves, a um, picture of a cucumber plant from the field on the, on the top in A, and then in B it's a bit of a close-up of a lesion on the bottom side of a leaf, and all of the gray that you see there are individual spores of uh, the pathogen. And now in C, when you put those spores under a higher magnification, under a microscope, they sort of look like lemons. So this one over here on the right-hand side, um, it's sort of football or, or lemony shaped. And when it gets wet, um, it actually releases what these are here in C. It's releasing swimming spores. And it's those swimming spores that actually infect the the cucumber or squash plant that's in your field. So what happens is that these gray spores in B fly to a new plant. That plant has a little bit of moisture on the leaf surface. Um, in that moisture, uh, this spore that landed on the healthy plant would then release these swimming spores and those swimming spores would then infect the healthy plant. It's kind of a, a complex life cycle. Um, so I thought I'd show you a few more pictures of that because it is um, unique in that um, these spores here, uh, again, under magnification, you can see the gray spores of the cucurbit downy mildew pathogen. And, and I should say that um, this cucurbit downy mildew pathogen is closely related um, to the pathogen that causes late blight of potato and tomato. And it's also um, fairly closely related to other uh, pathogens that cause downy mildew on other crops. So they all have uh, similar lifestyles in that um, they produce these spores that then blow in the wind. And you can see in this uh, blue shot here, we had actually um, stained some of the spores under a microscope. And um, this stalk right here is what would be attached to the leaf surface. And these branches here are where these individual sporangia or spores are attached. And in the morning when there's high humidity, lots and lots of these sporangia are produced. And then when the humidity begins to drop, they break away and blow in the wind and land on a healthy plant, as is shown here on the right-hand side of the slide. That healthy plant has even a little bit of water on, on the leaf. Then those swimming spores or zoospores would be released and they would attack the plant, the plant becomes diseased, you would then have more spores on the underleaf surface that would then fly and attack the next plant. So because so many spores can be produced in such a, a relatively short period of time, that's one of the reasons that we see um, a field of cucumbers such as the one on the right here go from looking completely healthy to very diseased in a short time, say a week to 10 days. And those of you that have had um, downy mildew in your field, you've probably seen, you know, the field looks very healthy, it doesn't look diseased at all, and then in a very short period of time, it'll seem like the plants, the leaves on the plants have just um, been taken over by downy mildew and have died. Um, I should say also that um, while the leaves are, uh, are the, where downy mildew infects, downy mildew does not infect the fruit, however, once the leaves die, that fruit becomes very susceptible to sun scalding. One thing I really wanted to point out today was the difference between powdery mildew, which is shown here on the left, and downy mildew, which again is shown here on the right. So powdery mildew, um, which is also very common, and I'm sure all of you have had powdery mildew on your cucurbits, um, gives you this uh, white powdery look on the upper leaf surface, um, which has a very uh, different look from the downy mildew. The powdery mildew, um, while it also 
blows uh, through through the air, blows in the wind, and lands on on plants and uh, spreads that way. It's actually not very closely related to the downy mildew. Um, so um, while while they seem in some ways similar, they're both called mildews. Um, the two pathogens are actually quite different, and um, some of the strategies that we use to control uh, powdery mildew are the same as downy, and some are different. Um, for example, those plants that have resistance to powdery mildew, to, uh, uh, that, that resistance to powdery mildew won't confer resistance to downy mildew. It's a whole different set of genes in the plant um, that make them dis, uh, resistant to downy mildew. So one thing that is, is important, I think, to understand is where is the pathogen coming from? Um, the pathogen can't survive over winter in New York, and it, it also it can't survive over winter um, really anywhere that has a cold winter at all. Um, in, in the eastern U.S., actually, in much of the U.S., where it can survive over winter is in southern Florida. So I'll show you some maps in a minute, um, but the way that Downy, one way that downy mildew can spread is that it can blow up from, from the south, from the southern U.S. It can blow up um, through the Carolinas, Virginia's up into the northeast. Um, uh, or more recently, say in the past decade, we've had a lot of greenhouse production of tomatoes and cucurbits um, pop up around the Great Lakes. And um, folks that are growing uh, cucurbits all winter long then uh, are actually uh, keeping downy mildew alive on the plants during the winter and in uh, the spring and summer um, when we plant cucurbits here in the northeast then sometimes we think that uh, the pathogen can spread from greenhouse production back into the fields. So if you're on the east coast or in eastern New York, um, the eastern north eastern northeast, uh, the inoculum could come either from the south or um, or from the west, and I will show you some maps of that. Uh, so here's a map of the United States, um, and in southern Florida is where we usually see the first downy mildew of the year. So right now, to our knowledge, there is no cucurbit downy mildew um, in, in the U.S., although um, it is possible that uh, folks that have cucurbits in high tunnels or greenhouses are, are keeping that pathogen alive on those living plants. So uh, one path for downy to move to the northeast is that um, in March or so, it's usually identified for the first time here in southern Florida. Now, um, colleagues of mine in Florida have done a lot of research to try to figure out where is that pathogen surviving the, the winter in Florida? Where does it come from in Florida when it gets onto the cucurbit crops? And the current thought is that it is actually surviving on um, wild cucurbits, uh, cucurbit weeds that are in southern Florida, and then um, moving on to our cash crops in about March. So. Uh, then, as we continue to plant, um, you know, cucumbers, squashes, pumpkins, watermelons um, throughout the East Coast, um, in June or so, it's usually detected in uh, Georgia, Carolinas. Um, by July um, and into August, then we would get the, you know, New Jersey, Virginia, and then um, uh, frequently we don't see it in Long Island until perhaps August. And then, you know, um, say 10 or 15 years ago, you know, the plant pathologist Meg McGrath on Long Island would say, hey, people in the Northeast, we have cucurbit downy mildew in Long Island, you know, beware, now's the time to be, to be vigilant. And that might not be until, you know, August, even late August. And then um, if we had hurricane remnants blowing in, the pathogen might blow inland and we might get... Um, cucurbit downy, downy mildew in the rest of New York um, or further north in the northeast, um, but we, we generally saw it in Long Island first. So that has really changed um, over, over the past uh, probably decade in that um, 
we now uh, have seen cucurbit downy mildew at least, uh, well, in New York, in Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Um, we tend to see cucurbit downy mildew show up in these areas uh, much earlier, or at least some earlier, than we see it in, you know, Virginia, New Jersey. Long Island. And again, the reason for that is, is perhaps because we have these uh, greenhouse, greenhouse production in the area. Um, importantly, um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing greenhouse production. Um, it's just that we need to understand when the pathogen might be coming into an area so that, we, that we're ready um, and we know how to, how to handle it when it arrives. Um, so in 2016, um, uh, we first uh, found the pathogen in July, I think it was July 20th or 25th, um, in western New York. Um, but it was, it was really very hot and dry in New York in 2016. Um, and it did move east, but it, um, it spread fairly slowly um, and didn't get... I'm here in Ontario County um, and, uh, and down in Tompkins County. And um, in those counties, you know, we, we didn't really see cucurbit downy mildew um, until mid-August or later in the season. Um, so, so it's important to understand that, that the pathogen is going to blow in. It's not in the soil um, here, it, you know, where, so that's one important factor in knowing how to, how to control it. And, um, you know, so are there cultural practices that can be used because we know uh, that the inoculum will be blowing in and we know hopefully roughly when it will be uh, blowing in. Um, there are some commercially available resistant cucurbits. Um, uh, the cucumber breeder here at Cornell, Michael Mazurek, has uh, several varieties that they're called DMR for downy mildew resistant. And um, uh, they're just becoming commercially available now. Um, right now they're available through Commonwealth Seed. Um, and there are also um, uh, some varieties of um, melon and butternut squash that are, um, be will be coming co commercially available uh, very soon. There are lots of breeders across the U.S. that are working on downy mildew resistant in all the cucurbit bro uh, crops. And it's actually um, been really exciting um, to see them all come together um, and work jointly towards this common goal of identifying resistance and, and using that resistance to, to, uh, to breed it into um, uh, commercially available varieties. So um, those have been really, really fun projects to work on. Um, as I said, uh, uh, we're working with breeders on resistance. Some of the work that I, as a plant pathologist, do is um, to, to try to really, to be honest, I try to kill the breeders' plants. Um, because if they, they breed the best they can and then they give them to me and, and I um, identify the most diverse group of strains that I can and, um, and try to kill the plants and then, you know, we sort of feel like, well, and, and plant pathologists in several different states do this, we feel like, well, if, you know, if we've done everything we can and, and the plant looks like the plant that's on the right-hand side, rather than the plant on the left-hand side, then uh, we feel much better about recommending it to growers and saying that there is uh, resistance to cucurbit downy mildew. And uh, you can see this cucumber plant here actually has a, a fairly nice-sized cucumber on it. Uh, so in addition um, to thinking about commercially available uh, resistant varieties, um, it's also important to, to follow where the pathogen is. Um, as I said, if you know when the pathogen is in your area, then you can start to, to do some cultural practices or harvest plants early um, so that all the fruit that are on the plants, if the leaves do um, become infected and die, then those, those fruit won't get sun scald. So some of the ways that you can really follow where the pathogen is, um, I know I work with plant pathologists in, um, in states up and down the eastern seaboard, and all of us have uh, newsletters that provide information on where downy mildew has been reported. 
And um, there's really an excellent website, and I've listed it here, but if you just Google Q Career with Downy Mildew, it'll get you here. And you can um, look at where the pathogen is, and you can even sign up for alerts. Um, it will email you or send you a text message. Now, this is a screenshot of the home page of the Q Kerbit Downy Mildew forecasting website. And it didn't come out really clearly in this, but uh, what you would see is a map. And um, uh, the, there is, this is the last map of the season um, that's shown here. Um, and if, it, if you looked at this map, you know, any time between the end of March and uh, beginning of November, uh, when, when it stops for the season, you would see which counties in which states would have active um, cucurbit downy mildew outbreaks. Um, you can see there was a lot of out outbreaks uh, around the Great Lakes and then outbreaks as well um, along the eastern seaboard that would have uh, started um, again in Florida and, and moved their way up. So I do recommend um, this cucurbit downy mildew site. It really gives you an idea of where the pathogen is. Um, so in terms of uh, how do you control cucurbit downy mildew, um, in New York, many of our growers are starting to plant their cucumbers in particular earlier. Um, that way they can harvest them earlier, and if they get them harvested by early August, uh, you know, before the disease is widespread, they actually sort of um, get their cucumbers harvested and done with before the disease arrives. So there's that window of opportunity prior to when downy mildew shows up. Um, that obviously isn't as effective with uh, winter squash or pumpkins or melons that need a longer season. Um, but for cucumbers, which are the most susceptible, this has been quite effective. We also have growers that are now growing uh, cucumbers in particular in high tunnels. Um, even though the high tunnels might have um, ends that open or doors or you know the sides are going to be up, um, that that roof over the top of the uh, of the cucumber plants does provide some protection from the spore that are blowing in the wind. And it, it will definitely keep the pathogen off the plants a bit longer. I've uh, been to several farms where growers will have uh, cuc cucumbers outside the high tunnel and cucumbers in the side high tunnel. And the high tunnel, um, in one case, kept um, the pathogens free of cucurbit downy mildew for nearly a month, and in most cases, um, at least several additional weeks before the, the disease is even seen at all in that high tunnel. So high tunnels really can provide some protection. As I said, um, cucumbers are the most susceptible, um, but all cucurbits can get downy mildew. And um, many of us have done, many uh, plant pathologists have done research that show that uh, different strains of the pathogen attack cucumber than those strains that then those that attack squash. So in New York, we tend to see the cucumber strains arrive earlier than uh, those strains that attack squash, but both of the strains are present each year. Um, and then there are uh, control products that are available for organic control that can be sprayed on the plant. And I thought I would talk about that a bit. My, my lab does quite a bit of work um, looking at the efficacy of organic control products. And for cucurbit downy mildew, the past two seasons, we've looked at seven different products that are approved for use in organic production. And um, for our experiments, the plants are grown in the field uh, because we're not we're not very good at weed control. We have too many things going on. We tend to grow them um, on plastic with weed cloth, which is not uh, how, how you folks would grow it, but we, we see a lot of disease. Um, we use a very susceptible cultivar called Diva. Um, and in this particular, in these experiments the last two years, we've included plant activators, that is products that enhance the, the um, defense responses or the immune system, as it were, of a plant so that they can uh, fend off pathogens longer. 
Um, we've used some of those, and we've also used products that act directly on the pathogen. That, that is, they, they kill that pseudoparanospora cubensis straight away. We, in our experiments, um, just because of the way we designed them, we sprayed every seven days. And um, the take-home message from this is that everything that we tried worked better than the control, which was not sprayed with anything. Um, but by the last rating, which was uh, three, just over three weeks after we first saw disease, um, all of the treatments had about 40% disease. Um, so I thought I'd talk uh, briefly about the products. Um, uh, Zonix is a really interesting product. We've tried it the last two years with uh, a good success. Um, it's a remnolipid biosurfactant. Uh, what that means is that um, uh, it will cause those swimming spores, the ones that, you know, once that's the, the larger lemon-shaped spore lands on the leaf, it releases those swimming spores. Well, this remnolipid biosurfactant actually causes those to explode, which is fantastic, right? So if those little spores explode, they are not going to attack the plant. Um, so that's kind of an interesting one. We used three different types of copper products. We used Nordox, which is a cuprous oxide. We used Cueva, which is a copper octanoate. It's a, sort of like a, a soap. And we used Champ, which is a copper hydroxide. Uh, we also used um, uh, double nickel, which is um, a microbial bacillus product, uh, regalia, which is an extract of the giant knotweed plant, and um, another microbial uh, actinovate, which is uh, streptomyces. And then uh, we combined the regalia and actinovate uh, together as well. So what you're looking at here in the far right-hand column um, are the final disease ratings. So the non-treated control had 77.5% disease, um, averaged over the four replications in the field. The, numerically, the best treatment was the Zonix. That's the one that blows up those little swimming spores, um, which had uh, just over 40% disease on, the, on those plots at the final disease rating. What these letters next to the numbers are, are the, the statistical comparisons that we do. And so um, if it has the same letter, then it's not statistically different. So everything, you know, the non-treated control is the only one that has the letter A. Everything is statistically significantly different from the non-treated control. Um, and then uh, the only other statistical difference would be that um, Zonix and Nordox, these two products at the top, would be statistically different from the Actinovate. Um, so, uh, as I said, all of the products were better than the non-treated control. Now, I know it's really important to know um, the cost of products, and so I thought I would include that here. Actually, um, my mission, Holly Lang, went through and figured out the cost per acre of each of the products that we use. Um, so, uh, the the least expensive um, were some of the copper products, um, and the most expensive um, were the extract, um, the giant extract, um, and um, one of the microbial products. The product that numerically was the best, um, Zonix, um, is also very expensive. So. Um, one really important question if you're going to use these products that are, are really expensive is when should I spray? And one of the ways that we have been looking at determining, you know, how do you know when to spray? Well, what we need to know is when is the pathogen in your area? Because you don't need to start spraying in June if the spores of the pathogen aren't going to arrive until August 20th, right? So what you want to know is when are those spores arriving so you can get out and spray before the spores land on your plant because that's when those sprays are going to be the most effective. So if we go back to this life cycle slide that I showed in the beginning, when we want to detect uh, the cucurbit downy mildew pathogen is right here before we see symptoms on those healthy plants, when those spores are flying through the air and landing on those plants. So, again, several of, of us uh, up and down the East Coast have been working on um, improving the detection strategies for cucurbit downy mildew. Um, what you see here on the right are um, 
they're called rotorod type spore samplers. And I'll, I'll show you some close-ups, but um, these were made by colleagues of ours at the USDA at Oregon State in Corvallis, um, Walt Mahaffey and David Gent. And, and you know, what, what Walt was using them for and, and Dave was in, in grape and hop production in Oregon. And, and they actually were using them for powdery mildew and downy mildew in, in hop production. So hops also gets downy mildew. It's actually quite closely related to the cucurbit downy mildew. So what this does is that this little part of the spore sampler right here spins around and it samples 62 liters of air per minute. We have a solar power uh, panel on attached to it as well as a battery inside that gray box and so it runs 24 hours a day seven days a week and it just spins around hopefully catching the spores that are in the air. The unit itself is mounted on a 4x4 post that you can see right here. We're putting it up in this uh, cucumber field. I think it's cucumbers. Um, and then you have two metal stakes pounded into the ground on either side of the 4x4. And um, the in this particular case, the ground was really hard. We were only able to get the 4x4 a few inches into the ground, and then we use large zip ties um, to tie the 4x4 to the metal stakes. So that's how it's uh, situated. Um, we try to keep the sampler just above the canopy so that we're uh, trying to detect the, the spores that would be landing on the canopy. Uh, the box here uh, contains the battery uh, and the motor that spins the rod. and um, we actually attached a small weather station so that we would have information on uh, temperature and humidity uh, as well as whether or not spores were present. And um, the crossbar, which I'll show you a close-up in a minute, and the rods uh, can either be mounted right on the box, for example, for this uh, cucurbit field, um, or it can be mounted higher. We've also used these in tomato fields to try to detect the late blight pathogen, and tomatoes are going to be taller, so you'd want it higher. So this is a close-up of uh, what's actually catching whatever is in the air. Uh, this is the crossbar. These are the rods that are uh, spinning around, and um, it's just a little O-ring holding them in place, and we put a very thin layer of silicon grease on each rod so that they're sticky. And when they are spinning around, um, they catch everything that's in the air, whether it's dust or spores or insect wings or cottonwood fluff. Um, so they can, they can really catch a lot of stuff. The rods can be easily carried to and from the field. Uh, what we do is we just uh, take a small tube, we put a little bit of plumber's putty in the lid, stick the rods in there, um, and it's a great way to camp, uh, move the rods around. Um, and they can even be sent in mail. Um, Meg McGrath, a colleague on Long Island that I work with very closely, um, has sent spores up from Long Island. Um, so then we bring the rods back to the lab, um, put them into the small tube, and we extract the DNA right off the rods. Um, I, I was so skeptical that it would work, but it worked. Uh, we were able to extract DNA. Um, and then we use that DNA um, in an assay uh, that is uh, very specific to detect cucurbit downy mildew. Well, at least we thought that it was very specific to detect cucurbit downy mildew. Um, so here are some of the results I, I thought I'd share with you, um, some of our successes and frustrations. Um, we, we don't believe that cucurbit downy mildew was in the area on June 8th to the 22nd, but we had uh, several positive results, and so we were confused by that. Um, we also had some positives and negatives in early July, and what we think actually has happened was that we were detecting hop downy mildew. There are several hop yards in the area. The hop downy mildew pathogen and the cucurbit downy mildew pathogen are closely related, and um, we think that might be what was happening there. Um, we were much more encouraged um, by the fact when uh, we did August 1st and August 3rd, and then we actually saw symptoms in the cucumbers in the field on August 7th. Um, but certainly, this system has promise, but there's a lot of work left to be done. <laughs> so what's next? Uh, well, we are working with, um, with many, many folks um, from 
from our colleagues in Oregon that are working on hop downy mildew to colleagues in um, Michigan, North Carolina, uh, Florida, um, to increase the specificity of the detection of the cucurbit downy mildew. We're also uh, working with breeders across the country um, to test the breeding lines that they produce to see um, if they're resistant in all sorts of different environments with all different strains of the pathogen. Um, we also are really interested in using um, detection in combination um, with weather data. Um, because just because the spores are in the area doesn't mean they're going to infect the plant. In, in years like last year in New York, you know, we didn't have rain from June 1st until perhaps August 18th. And so, you know, it, we were not going to see disease with no rain. And um, so it's really important to, to think about the weather data as well. Um, and as I said, um, we're screening breeding lines, uh, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, melons. Um, and many of these projects has, have been funded by the USDA. Uh, and with that, um, the work that I've shown, uh, for the most part, was not done by me personally, but by members of my lab um, who have been outstanding, um, and uh, cooperation with um, growers, vegetable extension educators, and really um, scientists, breeders, and plant pathologists uh, across the country. Um, we work very closely with the cucurbit downy mildew IPM pipe folks. Those are the people that are that put together um, the, the website. Um, and our project was funded by Cornell's um, New York State Ag Experiment Station, the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, um, and several grants from the USDA. And one thing I wanted to be sure uh, to tell folks was that um, it's always uh, completely fine if you have questions or, or images that you think, hey, is this downy mildew? Can you tell me? Um, I am more than happy to have folks contact me. I've listed my email here. Um, one, of the, one of the most common ways um, that, uh, that I interact with, with folks now is people will send me uh, digital images and say, hey, you know, does this look like cucurbit downy mildew to you or what do you think it is? Um, and depending on the, the disease and the symptoms, sometimes uh, actually quite often it's possible to tell what it is um, via images on the, on the computer screen. So if anyone ever has any questions, I encourage you to contact me. I don't mind that a bit. And with that, that um, Alice, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have, um, we probably have about half an hour for questions now. So if you have general questions about organic farming, you're always welcome to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. So that'll be on the next slide as well. Um, oh, so here we are um, with lots of questions now. The first question we'd gotten during the webinar was um, whether the spores need to attach to the bottom of the plant to become dangerous. Is that correct? Uh, no, well, no. So um, when the spores are flying through the air, they'll actually land on the upper leaf surface and infect through the upper leaf surface, but then they grow through the leaf and the new spores that will spread to healthy plants are on the bottom leaf surface. So the spores will on the upper leaf surface. Okay, um, here's a question about zonics. Um, whether it is specific to cucurbit downy mildew or would another surfactant be similarly successful? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have, so zonics is not specific for cucurbit downy. Um, we have done studies on other closely related uh, downy mildews and uh, Phytophthora, uh, late blight of potato and tomato. Um, Cucurbit downy, zonic seems to work particularly well on cucurbit downy mildew because cucurbit downy mildew can only attack the plant through those swimming spores. Um, some of the other downy mildews and late blight of potato and tomato, um, the, the larger lemon-shaped spores can germinate directly and kill the plant and the zonics doesn't do anything to those. So um, what we found is that zonic is, zonics is more effective against cucurbit downy mildew than some of the other downy mildews or late blight. In terms of other biosurfactants, um, that's one area that we are really going to look at next year. Um, the, the preliminary studies that we've seen, actually other biosurfactants that we tested did not work as well as that 
remnolipid uh, biosurfactant Zonix. So there's there's something unique about the Zonix, at least in our really you know small scale trial. Um, but that is definitely an area that we're interested in testing out. Okay, um, another question about Zonix. Um, how long is their residual activity of it, and how specific is the MOA to zoospores? Could it be used in an alternating spray program with biopesticides? Oh, great questions. Um, so, so uh, yes, it can absolutely be used in an alternating program. Um, I know several quite a few people that have uh, tested Zonix and um, it, it won't interfere with the uh, efficacy or the effectiveness of any other um, uh, biopesticide. Um, what was the first part of the question? Um, let's see. Um, I'm, Sorry. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I had it and then I... Activity. Right. Um, so um, uh, we have sprayed every seven days and um, and that was effective. It, it appears based on uh, looking at our two years of data that if it does not rain then the Zonix um, is effective easily for seven days, probably t at least ten days. If it rains um, it, it, uh, it doesn't appear to have a, a lot of um, uh, stickiness to the plant, which kind of surprised me. Um, it, it can wash off in a heavy rain, and that's when we would start to see increased disease when, when there was more rain. And, and that's when the environmental conditions um, for downy mildew are, are more favorable for the pathogen anyway. So it, it does have some residual activity. Um, it, it doesn't, uh, there are some products, um, for example, Oxidate, um, it, it kills on, on contact, it will kill spores, um, but it, uh, it is only effective for, for you know, just a few minutes, um, but uh, Zonix will last longer. Okay, um, we have a couple questions on where you can get those um, detection boxes or rod spore samplers and um, approximately how much they cost. Uh, right, so for research purposes, um, uh, I, I got mine, as I said, from uh, a colleague at Oregon State. Um, they are not currently commercially available. Um, they actually, it's interesting, they, they were a, a common commercially available um, detection strategy um, perhaps in the early 80s. Um, and then they have not been widely used, so they're not currently available. Um, and part of that is is also because um, you know many of us are not yet are not yet confident in the results, and we don't you know we don't want to um, encourage folks to use something that we're not confident in. Um, but uh, as the results improve, I'm hoping that um, companies that produce pathogen detection kits uh, or, or, you know, these spore rod type of traps will, again, make them commercially available. So they're, to my knowledge, um, I've only gotten them um, uh, through the folks at Oregon State. Okay. Um, how about row covers? Um, do row covers help stop cucurbit downy mildew from spreading? Uh, yes, uh, they absolutely can. If you get the row covers on early enough, um, uh, they can help reduce the um, number of spores that hit the plants. Uh, the row covers certainly won't keep, you know, the downy mildew spores are really small, and the row covers certainly won't keep off probably every spore, um, but um, it'll certainly reduce uh, the number of spores. Uh, I actually had uh, one grower um, uh, that uh, had uh, one section of her field that had downy mildew, and so she rogued out the plants that had um, symptoms, and then she actually put a row cover around uh, on top of the plants that she thought were probably infected, given their proximity to plants, with the, with the idea of actually keeping the pathogen in rather than keeping the pathogen out, which I thought was a, a really creative take on it. Um, and, and it was true that um, 
several of the plants that were inside the row cover uh, did become diseased, um, and she just left it there for those for those plants to die or be rogued out, and um, and the rest of her field uh, did uh, produce cucumbers until additional inoculum came in. Um, so that's probably not the way the person who wrote the question was thinking of using row cover, um, but yes, row cover can um, slow the the progression of the disease in the field. Okay. Um, why do you think open hoop houses are so effective? Is it the lack of dew settling at night? Um, and is there any level of screening that might prove effective? Yes. So I think it is the lack of dew settling at night because if you don't have any of that water on the leaves, then you know, the pathogen really isn't going to be able to take off. And I, I think additionally, um, you know, a, a lot of the spores, um, you know, might might come in from above and, and you know, there's some protection just based on the structure itself. Um, so I, yeah, in, in terms of uh, screening, I, I do know of um, a grower that has been looking at um, different types of, of screening and filters that could keep pathogen spores out, um, both uh, downy mildew for, for cucumbers and um, uh, late blight for tomatoes that are inside his uh, high tunnels. And um, he, he actually used a HEPA filter, a very high quality air filter, um, to, to basically prevent any of the spores from getting into the high tunnel. It, it was effective. The problem with that was that the high tunnel got really, really hot. And the tomatoes did okay in, in that extreme heat, um, but not all plants um, can handle that much heat. So there is, uh, you know, some, some screening can be effective, um, but it's, it's a bit of a trade-off. Okay. Um, let's see. It seems as if the chemical control methods were all curative methods. Is there any preventive method to spray just before spores enter your particular farm area? Um, for example, Bacillus subtilis, potassium bicarbonate, tank mix? Yes. So um, actually, any, any of the products that I showed would be more effective if they were on the plant before the spores arrived, um, for sure. Um, and uh, bacillus, um, again, for sure, you know, that's going to be effective um, as, a, as a microbial that, that's producing something that will act directly on the pathogen um, and, and um, uh, the the phosphorus compounds as well, and actually some of the phosphorus compounds will boost the plant's immune system, and anything that um, is to boost the plant's immune system, um, the regalia, the giant knotweed extract, is thought to have some of that as well. Um, you know, the sooner you put that on, the better off you are. Uh, well, you know, if you know it's in your area, again, you probably don't want to be spraying it all season long because it gets very expensive, but yes, if you put those compounds on, um, you know, it, before you see symptoms in your field, you will have um, better luck with control than if you put it on after you already see symptoms in the field, for sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned that different strains attack cukes and squash. Do you know if that's true for powdery mildew as well? Ah, that's a great question. And to my knowledge, that is that is not the case with powdery mildew um, that it is with downy mildew. Um, but I am not a total powdery mildew expert. <laughs> um, but uh, based on, based on um, the talks that I've heard, Meg McGrath, who is our powdery, mil powdery mildew expert here at Cornell, um, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. I think it's the exact same strain um, that will attack um, the, cu the cukes and the squashes and the melons. OK. Um, here is someone who's curious to know whether there's a way to detect or predict the arrival of downy mildew with percent humidity. Um, yeah, so one of the things on uh, the website, so that web, that cucurbit downy mildew website that I showed you um, is run by um, a scientist, he's, he's really great, his name is Peter Ojambo, and his expertise is in forecasting, and it's really, it, it, he's really good at math. And um, 
what he does on one part of that website is actually take into account uh, humidity and um, the the weather data that's predicted weather data, um, and along with uh, uh, the amount of sunshine, because um, those spores as they're flying through the air could be killed by UV irradiation. Um, and he predicts, he can make predictions as to where uh, the risk factor, he'll say high, medium, and low risk as for powdery mildew. So anytime you have high humidity, you're going to have a high risk for downy mildew. The other thing um, that is a risk, particularly as it gets later in the season, is when uh, you have that dew point. So if you're at nighttime, you're going below your dew point. Um, I mean, it's humidity, but, but you're also going to get uh, a lot of leaf wetness. So the amount, the length time that the leaves are wet is, uh, is a good predictor of uh, whether or not downy mildew can really take off. So lots of humidity is absolutely going to um, improve your chances of downy mildew. Okay. Um, can vegetable transplant shipped from the south be a source of disease spores? Uh, I know of one instance when that has happened, um, uh, maybe eight years ago or so, um, there were transplants shipped from the south um, to the Midwest, um, and they did have downy mildew, and in that particular season, um, downy mildew started very early in uh, Michigan, Ohio area. And so, yes, that absolutely can happen, and so it is important to... Um, to look at any transplants that come up. I think it's more common, um, at least in New York, uh, for folks to get, um, say, cabbage or tomato transplants from southern locations. Most of our cucurbits are direct seeded, um, but not all of them. Um, and any transplants that, that are coming in, it's always important to scout them um, and make sure they look healthy before you put them in the field. Okay, um, back to Zonix. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about the timing of it and also how low of a rate can you go with it and still get efficacy? Um, in terms of, of rates, we have only tried the, the labeled rate and uh, I'm trying to remember, if there is a range, we use upper range of the labeled rate. And on Zonix, I don't think there is. I think there's just a single labeled rate. At any rate, um, so I, you can go. I've only tried um, the labeled rate. Um, and the other question was in terms of timing. Yeah. Was that the first part of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, again, I think that I think that if you can get the Zonix on. Uh, before. Um, you're, you're going to be better off. Um, we spray it every seven days. I've seen uh, in grower fields um, where uh, growers were spraying on a seven to ten day schedule um, and um, it was effective. In, in particular, um, downy mildew tends to move a little bit more slowly on squash and um, in, a, in a squash field, I know a grower was spraying on a ten day schedule and was having uh, good luck with control. Okay. Um, were the weekly app, was that the weekly application cost that you were talking about per acre before, or um, what was it? Was the, yeah, it was a single single spray. That was that's oh, how much it costs spray. one time okay. per acre. Okay. Um, all right. Um, we have a couple of people online from Hawaii, and so they were wondering whether you'd ever worked with farms in Hawaii, or whether cucurbit downy mildew has been reported there. Do you have any experience at all with that? Yeah, so there is a plant pathologist at the University of Hawaii that has experienced with cucurbit downy mildew. I think uh, I think she came from uh, Mary Hausbeck's lab at Michigan State, and Mary is a colleague that has worked on cucurbit downy mildew for a long time. Um, I, I, I think it has been reported in Hawaii, um, but I don't... I don't, I don't think it's, my feeling is that it's not a limiting factor to cucurbit production, but I think it has been reported and you do have a plant pathologist that knows quite a bit about it there. However, if you, know, if you ever need me to come to 
Hawaii and check it out, you know, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, Especially <laughs> in February from the state of New York. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that there are different strains of downy mildew. Are there varieties that exhibit resistance to one in one region of the country, but then are susceptible to other strains in other regions? Have there has there been any research looking at that? Yeah, so um, that is research that's being done right now, and there have not been very many resistant varieties to test. And so um, now that there are uh, resistant varieties and breeder, you know, we have a large group of breeders and pathologists working together, uh, those are experiments that we're, we're doing now and we'll have you know, more answers to that question in probably two years. So for right now, I don't know. Okay. Um, here's a pretty technical question. You may need to explain what this means um, to those who don't understand, but um, this person is interested in knowing what the PCR targets are for your early detection assay. Absolutely. So when we extract the DNA from those rods that came in uh, from the field, what well, what we do is the assay, it's a PCR assay, that stands for polymerase chain reaction. And what that does is it takes all of that DNA, you know, it's from seeds and pollen and insects and downy mildew spores, and it's all mixed together. Um, but this particular assay amplifies a tiny region that's only in downy mildew. We thought it was only in cucurbit downy mildew. Turns out it's in both cucurbit downy mildew and hop downy mildew. The target that we used is actually um, from a, a mitochondrial DNA uh, gene. So inside the cells of the spore, um, they have mitochondria. They're the, the workhorse, the powerhouse of the cell involved in respiration and, and making energy so the cell can live. And so uh, we used a target uh, within uh, the mitochondrial DNA, um, and I, uh, uh, we had several different targets. The one that was most effective uh, was from the COX-2 gene. Okay. Um, is trellising an effective control since it keeps the cucumbers higher and drier? Uh, yes, um, uh, it is actually. It, uh, it it's not it's not going to prevent disease, um, but it help with the drying of the leaves, as as the person who wrote the question said. And um, you know, it, again, if if the disease is in the area and uh, causing large problems, you're going to have disease on the trellis plants as well as the plants on the ground, but it might give you extra time uh, to harvest those fruit um, before the leaves die and you, and you get the sun scald. So it will help, but it is certainly not uh, the only strategy that you should, you know, it's not going to prevent downy mildew from killing the plants. Okay. Um, where does downy mildew survive besides the air and the plant? Does it also survive in the soil? Um, so, no, downy mildew, uh, the cucurbit downy mildew uh, does not survive in the soil, to the best of our knowledge. Um, uh, it will survive on the plant um, and, then, and then as it blows from plant to plant. So, uh, it, it, it can live on... Um, cucurbit weed hosts, so um, especially further, further south in New York, there are um, wild or, you know, cucurbit weeds that it, that it can live on, um, but it has to be on plant tissue in order to survive. And it, even when I work on it in the um, many plant pathogens you can grow in culture, um, you know, in, in a petri dish, uh, however, cucurbit downy mildew is one of those pathogens that has to to be on a living plant tissue in order to survive. Okay. Um, do you find that the range of downy mildew is expanding with climate change, or is its range all about how far it can travel in a season? Well, I think there's. I think the answer to both of those is yes. Um, it is about how far it can travel in a season, um, but as the season gets longer, 
um, it's it's going to be you know it's going to be able to travel further more quickly, and so um, I I think that that yes um, you know we'll we'll see um, this downy mildew spread more quick as uh, as we get warmer temperatures um, and um, and because of that season extension and, and that plants will be in the field earlier and later, we'll see certainly an expansion of, of the range of downy mildew. Um, okay. Have you published the results of your e efficacy trials anywhere? Um, and if so, where could one find that? Yes. So um, the <laughs> the place where plant pathologists publish our uh, efficacy trials are uh, they're called PDMR reports, um, and uh, those are available. I think if you Google PD plant disease management reports is what that stands for. Um, also, uh, within the next um, several months, we'll be having all of those uh, efficacy trials on a website. Um, several uh, different folks have asked, you know, you guys do all this great work and it's really hard to find the efficacy trials that you've done. And so those will be available um, uh, on a web that you would that you would be able to get to through um, Cornell Vegetables website. Um, those will be available shortly. Okay. Um, in what other areas of the USA um, is cucurbit downy mildew present? Is it all over the U.S.? Um, uh, you know, it's 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 predominantly uh, in the eastern half of the country. Um, last last year, I mean, there's reports from Missouri, Louisiana. Um, wherever there's there's rain in in places where it's it's very dry, um, you know the leaves stay dry. You're you're not going to see cucurbit downy mildew. It's it's more common in in the areas where it rains. Okay. Um, how much should growers in midwestern states worry if the disease was reported in greenhouses and high tunnels the previous year? I I think it's if if it were my farm or garden, I, and I knew that there had been uh, cucurbit downy mildew the previous year, I, I would be scouting. I mean, it, it won't survive the winter, um, but, you know, if there's plant tissue that survives in a greenhouse or, or in a high tunnel over the winter, if it, you know, last winter it wasn't very cold, and so certainly there could have been living plant tissue, um, then the, the downy mildew would survive. So I think that scouting um, uh, your cucurbit crops and just keeping your eyes open for for disease that might be there is it's really important to do. Okay, um, back to Zonix. Um, how many times do you, you think we need to apply it in order to get good control on cucumbers? Yeah, so the tricky thing about about the downy mildew is that um, you know we you have to know how uh, you know how many of the spores are going to be coming in. So, if there is a field to the you know downwind of uh, oh, sorry up, upwind, you know going to blow past before it gets to your farm, then you're going to continually have showers of spores raining down on your cucurbit field. And so, once downy mildew is in the area, you're really going to need to protect those plants um, once a week. Uh, or, or the disease will begin to take off. And, and once you see, wh what we've seen in our fields at least, when there's a high disease pressure in the area, once you see, you know, 10 or 15 percent disease on, on plants in the field, um, it's really, really hard to control the downy mildew once it gets to that level. So you really have to control it before it explodes in your field. Okay, um, we have a couple questions here about um, distinguishing um, powdery mildew and downy mildew. I know you um, showed a couple of comparison slides in the um, presentation, and um, I just want to remind people that you can download a copy of the um, slide handout in the handout section of your control panel, um, in case you missed that at the beginning. Um, but um, some of the questions are, um, do the spores underneath the leaf um, look the same in um, powdery and downy mildew. I know you showed what the upper surface of the leaf looks like. 
Um, so the, the powdery mildew is always going to be uh, whiter than the downy mildew. The downy mildew is always going to have much more of a gray cast, and the powdery mildew will have a white cast. The, the powdery mildew um, also has the appearance of when it, when it has lesions that are very young, um, to me, it'll almost look like someone took a paintbrush and sort of flung it at the plant, and you'll get um, a, a, a number of small white spots on, on, the leaf, uh, on the leaf surface, either upper or lower leaf surface, um, whereas the downy mildew has those uh, yellow lesions um, that are generally delineated by the veins of the plant, and powdery mildew doesn't have that. Okay, and then someone else is asking whether it's true that powdery is more of a cool weather pathogen and downy is a warmer weather pathogen? Um, uh, I would say I would say no. Um, powdery tends uh, powdery does not need as much water on the leaves to infect the plant. So um, powdery mildew is one of those pathogens that, that actually can do well. In, in heat, um, it doesn't need much water, whereas the downy mildew uh, will need water. Um, and it, it has a fairly broad range of, of infectivity. You know, um, downy mildew uh, will thrive from probably you know 65 or 70 degrees up to up to 90 or 95, which is why it can do so well all the way from Florida, you know, all the way up um, through the Northeast. Have you seen any <clears throat> sorry have you seen any instances where a plant is attacked by both downy and powdery mildew? Sadly, yes. Um, and and that can actually be quite common. Um, more and more growers in New York are using uh, varieties that are resistant to powdery mildew. There are there are quite a few varieties available that are resistant to powdery mildew, but um, uh, you know, and sometimes people don't or, or in in some crops, there are not as many uh, varieties that are resistant available. So yes, you will see both. And what you see is on the upper leaf surface, you'll see um, the white spots along with the yellow spots, the white spots being the powdery mildew and the yellow spots being the downy mildew. And then when you flip the leaf over, you'll see um, both, again, the white uh, of the powdery mildew and the gray of the downy mildew. Okay. Um, can you talk about the results that you had with resistant cucumber varieties? Uh, yeah, actually, that's that's really exciting. Um, there, uh, the again, the the uh, breeder that I've worked the most with is uh, Michael Mazurik here at Cornell, and um, uh, he has uh, one variety uh, that is called. DMR401 um, that, that really looks very good and he's continuing to breed with that variety. It has a high level of resistance and um, a, a, a slicing type fruit um, that, that is, is quite nice. Uh, most growers find it to be nice, uh, a nice marketability and he's continuing to work with that to um, uh, uh, increase both the quality of the fruit and also move that uh, downy mildew resistance into uh, pickling cucumbers as well. Okay, um, I just put the link to more information about that in the chat box. Um, we host a website um, for that um, breeding project. Um, so I had typed it in earlier, but I didn't have time to talk about it. So I just put that link there in case anybody wants to have a look at some more information about that um, breeding project. So um, perfect. Yeah, we have a couple more minutes here, so I'll try to get through as many as I can. Um, how do stink bugs figure into this picture, or do stink bugs figure into this picture in terms of spreading disease? Uh, I am not a fan of the stink bug. We seem to get <laughs> zillions of them every season. Um, <laughs> but having said that, um, they they don't uh, transfer downy mildew. Um, stink bugs have uh, little impact on the downy mildew, although in plants that have heavy stink bug infestation, it tend to have oddly less downy mildew um, because those plants aren't as vigorous, and downy mildew definitely likes the healthy, vigorous plants. Okay. Um, do you have any additional information about the active cultures in the regalia and actinovate? Are these culturable on a small farm via compost or compost tea? 
Um, right, so the regalia is um, not an active culture. It's an extract from the giant knotweed, um, but the actinovate um, is, and I have one other that was in there that I can't think of right now, um, uh, but uh, uh, they are very difficult to culture, and in compost, they probably won't live very long. Um, uh, you know, just the active cultures that are there aren't going to thrive in in the in the compost environment, is my understanding. Okay. Um, since you state that downy mildew off only attacks plants by swimming spores, does this mean that there has to be rain or dew in order for it to infect a plant? Uh, yes, there has to be some water on the leaf in order for it to infect a plant. It can be a very small amount of water, but there does have to be some water in order for it to infect the plant. Okay. Um, do you think there might be any companion plants that could help, for example, Japanese knotweed? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I have not seen any data on that and I don't I don't think you know that the extract of knotweed is what we were spraying on the plant and I, 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 I don't think that proximity to the knotweed would um, be enough to, to boost the immune system or, or um, detract the downy mildew um, but I don't actually have any uh, any data on that okay um. Let's see. Um, I think we have time for one final question here. Um, please feel free to use the um, Ask an Expert service or contact us afterwards um, if you have questions that haven't been answered. I've covered most of them here. So um, somebody just put in a comment about knotweed and said, good golly, it's such a, knotweed is such a serious invasive plant. Why would you include it in a field? <laughs> so um, that's a good point, too. Um, <laughs> I was thinking so, the same thing. But <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, last question. Have you tested any sprays such as water mixed with sodium bicarbonate or detergent or vinegar or milk to control this disease? Uh, yes. So, three seasons ago, I, we, have, um, we have tried some uh, bicarbonate product, products which have some efficacy against the powdery mildews, um, but they were not effective against the downy mildew, um, uh, nor was the... Um, the the milk product or um, uh, the the soap we we did we did not see um, any difference from the untreated control with those. Okay, well thanks Chris for this wonderful um, marathon of question answering. You ended a little early, so we had a lot of time for questions. And I'd like to thank everyone who submitted all these great questions. It was a terrific discussion here. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And we'd love to have you back when you know even more. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. 